Well, it's just so wonderful to be able to have Sister Joanna from Harvest Revival Ministries. Amen. And it's just wonderful to be able to, uh, for her to come here, but also, you know, as she's a board member here of Jehovah Jireh Christian Ministries as well, just to be able to, for, to know that she is on our board. And so we're just so grateful and thankful for that. God is, is just so, it's just so wonderful how God has just brought our relationship together. I love her very, very much. And of course, I know she loves me, right? <laughs> But I love her very, very much, and it's just so wonderful to be able to um, walk together, co-laborers together, and just knowing that the kingdom of God is advancing, and just to really know that she flows in revival fire. She loves revival. She lives for revival. She walks in revival. She prays revival. Everything about her is, is revival. And she just loves the Lord so much. And that uh, she just, uh, you know, as we were singing that song about the fire, let your fire burn. And she has that fire burning within her heart. And she keeps that fire burning on the altar, her altar for the Lord. And she knows to keep that fire burning on her, on the altar. And as we too just need to keep the fire of the Lord burning on our altar as well to keep that freshness just in our relationship. And that's what she does. She keeps that freshness of the relationship with that Lord, with her Lord. Amen. And, and it's just so wonderful just to see how God is just takes her all over internationally. She just came back. She'll share that. But she just came back from Colombia and, and being there, you know, even in Ecuador and uh, Med Medellin and these places. So we just praise God that um, she just got home from actually from Colombia. So she did just on Friday, last Friday. And so she's, she's always on the go. Amen. She's always on the go. And, uh, and here we have her even here for, uh, for her to be here with us. as she will be here with us. So she will even till Tuesday. So we just thank the Lord for everything, how God has provided and made a way for this anointed wonderful apostolic evangelist because she flows so apostolically and to be able to hear the message that God has given to her. Amen. So are you ready, vessels? Are you ready? Because even as I was sitting in worship, you know, it was like I was hearing the Lord saying, are you ready to have your vessel filled? Are you ready? Because I felt that this is what God was saying. You know, it's the oil of the Holy Spirit that will cause the light to burn bright inside of us. And he wants to fill us more. And I know that we're going to get filled up more with the presence of the Lord. Amen. Tonight. So just reach up and say, I am hungry, Lord. And I am your vessel. And fill me up, Lord. Because I need you and want you. And I thank you, Lord, that I believe that you're going to do it. In the wonderful name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, I welcome you, Sister Joanna Coherden. <laughs> welcome back to Canada and to the snow. <laughs> Love you, gal. I kept saying I didn't bring the snow. I didn't want a lynching mob. <laughs> you know, because I know y'all get a whole lot of it. And I know I don't hardly see snow, but uh, it's beautiful. I believe that it's significant as to what he wants to do. He wants to wash us white as snow. He really wants to do a cleansing in us and in the church because he loves us. He loves us so much. I, I, I was telling, uh, I think I was telling Pastor Carol, if not somebody, as I was looking out the window of my room in, in Columbia in Medellin, and I saw hundreds of, I mean, those people just, hustle bustle and they walk a lot and they ride motorcycles a lot and 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 yet there's tons of cars and it's just crammed there's just millions of people in each city they're just overloaded with people and i was watching these masses of people and and looking and of course i'm up in a high 
um, story of a hotel, so they look smaller down there. And I thought, how tiny we must look to God, way up in heaven looking down at us. We probably are that. And I'm thinking, yet he looks down at us and says, I love you. And he has every hair. I'm thinking of all those people I'm looking at. I said, you got every hair numbered on my head and on their head. Even those that that uh, are not even knowing who him and, and have served him or have found him yet. And I'm sitting there looking and I'm going, how massive and awesome is our God? You know, we just really kind of don't really grab it. I guess it's going to kind of fit with some of my message of it's unexplainable, yet it's undeniable. We fully cannot explain God, but we can't deny him. I mean, you just look at the sky and the earth. You look at the snow. You look at rain. You Just even when I was seeing the picture that they had up here of the sky in red, and I thought, God is just burning even the skies with fire of revival. He wants such a move to begin to happen. He's already told me I don't hold revival back. He doesn't want to keep revival from us because he wants his children to be refreshed, renewed, restored, refired. Come on. This is what he wants. And he loves us so much. Oh, anyway. But I do have impartation materials on the table, and I'm excited to be back here. Hello, family. I'm home. You know? Yeah, it's, it's easy to come home. <laughs> and it's been too long. I'm like, oh, Lord, so thank you, Canada, for opening up. <laughs> so I could get here to be with y'all. I have missed you. And, and, and even hearing about the great things God is doing in the services. Wow. So I'm just going to get some of that splashed on me while I'm here. Even though you think, well, no, you come to impart to us. Well, sometimes I, I'm in receiving mode, too, as well as imparting. Amen. And so I'm excited. And, of course, many of you know I'm Jack Coe's daughter. And, and, and many of you probably already got the book. But there is a couple of books out there still on the Jack Coe story. He had the largest tent in the world, held 22,000 people, 10 to 20,000 standing outside, blind eyes open, the lame walk, the deaf ear. Let me tell you something. When you sit in that kind of anointing, that kind of revival, you're never satisfied. Until he starts moving like that again, I may be happy and I may be on fire, but I'm not fully satisfied until I'm sitting in the middle of that again. And so I just keep saying, do it again, Lord. R-E in revival, refresh, renew, restore means do it again. That means if he's done it before, he'll do it again. So the good news is it's going to happen. I just want to be in the middle of it. Amen. And then, of course, my dad wrote the book called Curing the Incurable. Doctors say they're incurable diseases and people cannot be cured. But Dr. Jesus says, wrong. I cure the incurable. So that's an awesome book, too, about. And, of course, there's some other books. But the good news is we have a book. I have, <laughs> I have had people saying, when are you going to write a book? When are you going to do your book? And I'm like, I'm, I don't know. I don't have time. I don't. But I, I had a pastor who kept being persistent, who helped with it, got it on Amazon, and uh, help, helped us put it together. And then Bill Johnson did the forward, Pastor Bill Johnson in California. And, you know, he did this during the time he was losing his wife. He said, could I have a little longer? I know you had a deadline on your book, but my wife is sick. And then the next thing I read is she has passed away. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. But he still went ahead. He didn't say, look, I, I just can't. He said, no, I'm going to do that. I would be honored to do it. So I'm excited that he became a part of wanting to do, do the forward and to honor our family. The book is called It's a Miracle. Because you see, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Still does miracles today. He didn't stop doing it over 2,000 years ago. He didn't stop after Jack Coe, A.A. A. Allen, and William Branham's day. But I'm here to tell you, he still heals today. He still does miracles today. And it's time the church get back into it. 
I am ready for the miracle signs and wonders. I don't want to just talk about it. I want to be in it. How about you? And so there are stories. This is testimony stories. It's not a, 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 a book. Now, there is a main character, Jesus. He's the main character of this book because he's the one who's done it all. We're just telling the stories of what we got to be witnesses of, stories of some of my father. We found out the reason it's called book one. We couldn't even get them all in there. So that means we got to do another book. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no, because this takes a lot of time. But praise the Lord, he's, he's going to help. I had a prophet say, God said, if you'll give him 30 days, he'll help you with book two. I thought, where am I going to put 30 days in? But maybe I'll do two weeks here or there. I don't know. I'll leave it up to him. He helped me through this. He's going to do it again. Amen. But if you know somebody that's struggling with sickness, pain, don't believe. Maybe they lost their faith. The whole reason I didn't do this book to, to say, oh, yeah, I want a book out there. Because I kept arguing with God. There's enough books out there. And most people don't even read the book. <coughs> So what's another book on a shelf? You know, I just don't. And But the I just kept fussing with the Lord, and it was like, it's to help build faith. A lot of people today don't believe that Jesus still heals today. So that's what me and my husband, we want people to know he does, and we want this to build faith. And so if you're dealing with people sick in the hospital, friends, you might get one, get it to them and say, read up. And the reason we did it in stories instead of making it like one big, uh, a, a girl who was dying in the hospital, Anna, which her miracle story isn't in here yet. She's one of them. But she said, you know what would have helped me <clears throat> when you were praying and others is to have somebody just to read me some miracle stories. She said, because it was so tough when the doctors kept coming in and me and my baby were dying. And they're alive. They're still here. They're, it's good. The good report. She still has some issues, but not like she was having. The doctors told them she wasn't going to make it and the baby wasn't going to make it. And all I kept saying, it's your breath in her lungs. It's your breath in the baby's lungs. So we pour out our praise. Pour out our praise. Come on. And, and just, I kept telling her, you're going to live. And so, anyway, it was because of her that we did it in testimony stories because people in the hospital don't have time to hear the whole book. Amen? And so sometimes just those short, short, short stories telling what God has done builds faith. Amen? So it's out there. And, of course, we have the... CDs, music, gospel music to put on, uh, it, Alabaster Box, um, I Can Only Imagine, Midnight Cry, I, uh, My Tribute, Jesus Take the Wheel, some others, there's some more CDs out there of music. We have the bandanas we pray over for healing, miracles, signs, and wonders, and salvation and deliverance. And so if you want to pick up a bandana to give to somebody and you don't want them to know it's been prayed over, you can be an undercover agent and give them gifts out there and, and take it because we pray over the bracelets and all the other things too for, for miracles. Amen. And then, of course, we have bracelets from Nepal. And I hadn't been there yet, but I already have some. <laughs> and I have been going around, and I didn't realize I was going to get to go to Nepal in March. So I'd been telling people, we need to pray for Nepal. And I have these bracelets, and they roll on, and they roll off. I had, for over a couple of years, been selling these bracelets, just praying for Nepal. And I didn't know why. And then I get invited, and I'm like, thank you, Lord. You were setting me up. <laughs> And so those are out there, bracelets from Nepal. If you want to be a part of Nepal, you want to sew in, you want to be praying for us while we're, Pastor Carol and Pastor Ted and us are there, you can be a part. Amen. If you can't get a bracelet, that's fine. Still pray for us. But that kind of helps remind you. You got that bracelet, and you're like, oh, yeah, Nepal. Amen. I'm believing for lots of salvations. I'm believing for miracles. I'm for believing for a move of God to stir in the hearts there that they will go out into places that other people can't get to and those people that we impact will get to other people and they'll be calling and saying, uh, revival has broke here. Amen. Hallelujah. And disciple crosses are back. I've had them before, been out for a while. They are back. And, of course, you know they're adjustable, long or short. But the great thing is, is this right here represents the whip they beat 
Jesus with. And these spikes represent the nails that went into his hands and feet. And this wrapped around represents the crown of thorns that went around his head. So when he was on the cross, you were on his mind. People come up and you're wearing a necklace and they say, oh, I like your necklace. You can take it off and tell them that story and begin to tell them, you know, it was uh, because of the cross, it because there's healing, there's uh, whatever they need prayer for. And it was all because you had a cross or you gave one. There was a lady, she said, I don't have anybody in my neighborhood that likes me. She said, I'm going to get some and give them his gifts. So she went out and knocked on doors. She said, but I got something for you, but I want to tell you the story first. A lot of her neighbors got saved, and she has church in her neighborhood, and people call her all the time. So she has lots of friends now. Amen? Amen. Wow. So thank you. Thank you for those of you online. I know you're not here to buy these materials, but, hey, if we're here till Sunday. You still have a chance to come catch up and get some. If not, you can call and say, I want to get, and if the people here at the church know you and stuff, maybe we can figure out a way to get it to you. So stay with us. Stay online. Thank you for being online. Um, let me put this down. Hallelujah. It's great to be in the house of the Lord. I said, it's great. It's fantastic. It's wonderful. It's exciting. Amen? Some people, oh, no, 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 no. It's like, okay, get on the deliverance line. Amen. David said, I was glad, thrilled, overjoyed, excited. He said, one day, one day in the house of the Lord is better than a thousand years in the tents of the wicked. One day. We get to spend more than one day in here. <laughs> Amen. So what is this? cup coffee cup too right so a lot of times i don't know if they do it here but i remember when i was growing up in a lot of the cafes and restaurants when you went in your cup would be like this and it would be sitting on a saucer and so when you went in if you wanted coffee you would turn it up like this to let them know you wanted coffee right well, then if they didn't, I remember many times when I would, and I'd be wanting coffee, and they'd go by, and they'd have the pot and say, hello, coffee, 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 hello. I'd even put it on the edge of the table. I had one lady say to me that was carrying the co pot, coffee pot around, she says, oh, I'm sorry, you're not in my section. I said, okay, that doesn't matter. You got the coffee pot. She said, yeah, but I I'll go tell your waitress. <laughs> I'm like, just give me some coffee. So then I have to go find it. If I can't get coffee and I've tried, then I go find it. And I pour my own coffee. And if I've got people at the table with me, I'll bring the pot back and pour them coffee too. Amen. Of course, if the manager came, ma'am, 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 we'll get your coffee. Well, nobody has yet. Well, we will. And a lot of times if the manager figures out you want it, he is going to make sure that you're going to get coffee because he didn't want you back there at his station trying to get your own, right? Well, you know, when we come to church, we might come like this. Or sometimes we might come like this. But if you want God, he will fill you up. you got to turn it up like this. And what I'm trying to say to you is these next few days, I don't want your cup like this and your cup, neither does he. I want you to come in and turn your cup up. And if you hadn't got it, hello, Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm getting on the edge. I'm getting on the line. I'm going to go find it. You got it. You got something there. Pour in. I need something in my cup. Amen. We need to come in and get filled up. When you're full, and he not only does full like she said, he's a multiplication. He does full to overflow. He does excessive. So you'll be splashing on others. That's why in that coffee cup they had that saucer there because when it did pour over, it would all be down in that saucer. And you know what you, I don't know what y'all would do, but when I was really ready for coffee, I'd pick that saucer up, even get that, that drip down. But then on the bottom of my cup, all of that would start dripping on me. Yeah. Well, they let it drip on us. 
Amen. And so when you come, get your cups ready. So if your cup's not turned up, say, Lord, I'm flipping my cup over. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven. Feed me, feed me, feed me till I want no more. Well, I'm going to promise you, if you get it, you're going to want more. I always thought, I've never been at that place where fill me till I want no more. It might, I mean, I've been so full, I've been wiped out in the floor. And I can't get up. But when I left and even in the floor and couldn't go to sleep, and everybody says, she's drunk and all of that stuff. But when I, if I ever got to sleep, when I woke up the next day, I never said, oh, I'm so full, I don't want no more. I was like, whoo, do that again. I want more. <laughs> I want more of you, Lord. I want more of you, Lord. Put a fire down in our souls that we can't contain, that we can't control. We want more of you, Lord. We want more of you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Fill us up. Fill us up, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, Lord. I ask the words I speak tonight be the words you want spoken. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you change our hearts and lives. And, Lord, that you begin to turn us white as snow. I believe the significance of what you're doing is what you're wanting to do in the church. From Texas to Canada. <laughs> Since I'm the one who brought it, then all right, I'll take credit for the Lord wanting to turn us white as snow. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Only believe. Only believe. All things are possible. Only believe, only believe, only believe, all things are possible, only believe, Lord, I believe. Do you believe if you say, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief? Tell him. Lord, I believe all things are possible. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Oh, things are possible all things are possible lord i believe then you have to do the next step lord i receive <laughs> lord i receive all things are possible Lord, I receive, Lord, I receive, Lord, I receive, all things are possible, all things are possible, see, he does the impossible, and makes it possible. All things are possible. Lord, I believe. Tell him again. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. All things are possible. Lord, I believe, Lord, I believe, Lord, I believe, all things are possible.
impossible. Oh, say it again. All things are possible. All sickness, disease, and pain and torment are possible. Lord, I believe. Now thank him. Say, yes, Lord, I believe. I praise your holy name. I thank you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Have that own way, Lord. Amen. Well, a lot's been happening. I've been on Zoom in Pakistan, 2,000 Women's Conference. And out of those 2,000 women, 864 got saved. Two had tumors that dissolved. Two had withered hands that were healed and straightened out. And the insane became sane. You don't hear a lot about that in our churches today, but in my dad's day, I saw a lot of insanity and people who got delivered. I saw people who, whose minds that, that came in and they couldn't talk and they couldn't eat and they had all kinds of problems and God would literally do miraculous things. There was one young boy named Ivan who came to one of my dad's meetings. They had brought him, he couldn't eat. They told him he wouldn't live to be uh, six years old because he wouldn't be able to feed himself. He wouldn't be able to digest food. He couldn't talk. He couldn't take care of himself. But the family, the mother stayed home, but the, and, and the family brought the little boy. And my dad prayed for that little boy. And when he did, going home, he didn't say anything right then and there, but when he going home, he said, "Tell, I, I see light. I see the light. You see the light? And they were like, Ivan, you're talking. He said, when you get home, would you tell mama that? He said, yeah, I tell mama I see the light. So he runs in the house. Now, he wasn't walking either, so God healed him. Not only did he get up, was he walking, but he was talking. And he ran in the house hollering, Mom, Mom, I see light. I see light. I see the light. Wow. All things are possible. <laughs> I'm ready to see God move again. I'm ready to see those minds who are twisted and those who have diseases and tormented. Even when I watched her tonight, I said, God, that's the miracles that I want to see too. Not just the blind eyes open, the lame walk. I love all of that. Even salvation is the greatest miracle of all. But to know that God would take and what the devil came to destroy and some things at birth, and to say that the insane became sane, the twisted mind became normal. They have doctors all over the place scratching their head, coming with pens and papers and, and cameras and everything. So tell us how this happened. Can you explain this to us? We need to know because scientifically we have not had this happen. And yet they said they went to a revival meeting and that they were prayed for. And we told them at first y'all gave them a shot. And when the shot wears off, that you'll be back like you was. Well, you know, some of the people were smart enough from my dad's meeting that said, well, doctor, if there's a shot like that, why didn't you give that to me? Come on. If there's such a shot like that that works, then I should have that shot from you. He said, but I don't think it is a shot. If it is, I don't think it's going to wear off. <laughs> And it wouldn't, and then I could just see doctors trying to come. We, we need to talk to somebody. We need to find out what happened here. I'm telling you, it's unexplainable. Yet you can see the evidence that they didn't have their mind or they wasn't able to talk or they wasn't able. There was looping going on. Come on. And, and these different things, and now it doesn't. Autism made whole. Down syndrome made whole. Come on, church. I'm sorry, but I'm ready to be in the middle of these things. My God does the supernatural. But we have come to a point that we say we believe, but yet we doubt. If you have doubt and fear, you're displeasing God. The reason that people would talk about my father's boldness and the bold faith that he had 
The reason is, is because he believed. When he was in New York City, he walked up to a woman, had a garter hanging down the hill, and he walked up and he slapped it. And when he did, that thing just disappeared. And the skin was just hanging down there. And then my dad grabbed that skin and started doing this, said, in the name of Jesus, and that thing tightened up. I said, boy, she got a free facelift right there. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> this is the thing the supernatural should be natural in the church. The supernatural is what we should be in the middle of. We have lot our eyes on everything except him. It's time to get our eyes back on Jesus. It's time to realize that he wants to do the supernatural. This is the God who spoke to the, the, the dark, vast world and said, let there be light, and like that was light. Who separated the light from darkness. Scientists still to this day are trying to explain how these things happen. They try to figure out where God come from. For God to come from anything or anyone destroys his deity and he is no longer God. They're not going to be able to explain it. We serve an unexplainable yet an undeniable God. And I believe that the greatest revival in these last days that we will be in will be the unexplainable and the undeniable happening. The miraculous will be so much so the miracle signs and wonders will have us in awe. So I stir the churches back up to say, where did it go? It's time to let him back in. It's time to be the church God's called us to be. People are desperate today, and they're losing millions and millions of dollars are going into prescription drugs and into doctors, and we've already seen just in the last few years the destruction that has now come from that because they now know they've got you depending on them. My faith is in you, Lord. My hope is in you, Lord. My life is in you, Lord. It's in you. It's in you. Come on. And so I would say, wake up, church. Come back to that place in God. There was a lady named Stella Zimmerman who got very sick. She had a seven-pound tumor, and her appendix ruptured. And when they ruptured, they went throughout her body, and they turned gangrene. By the time her daughter was a nurse who, who worked for the hospital, Dupree Hospital at that time it was called, and by the time she got her mother to the hospital, the doctors went throughout and said, honey, there's nothing we can do. Gangrene has set in, and it's, there's poison all in her body. She, her appendix has ruptured. She has a seven-pound tumor, and she has cancer. And all the news was just take her home, make her comfortable, because she's not going to last long. So the daughter who was the nurse took her mother home, called the family, and they all gathered around, and, and they were talking to her and, and saying, Mom, you know, we're really sorry. And that night she had a dream, and the next day she called all of her children. She said, get a hold of the kids, tell them all to come back. And so they said, what's going on, Mom? She said, well, I had a dream. I'm going to be healed. A miracle's going to happen in a healing meeting in Lubbock, Texas. And the son said to the nurse friend, his sister, he said, come here, step outside. So she stepped outside, and he said, not only is she dying, but now she's losing her mind. And he said, what do we do? And then she said, there's nothing we can do. It is sad. The whole family's like she's losing her mind. Later that day, her daughter, because they had to be careful because all of this stuff in the, the – the tumor could rupture, so they had to be careful how they turned her, moved her. They couldn't take her anywhere and do things. So she was sponge bathing her, and she had kind of gently turned her over, and laying on the floor was a newspaper. Divine Miracle Healing, Lubbock, Texas. The largest tent in the world, Jack Coe meeting, blah, 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 and she started crying. And the daughter said, Mama, what's wrong? Am I hurting you? She said, no, there it is. That's where I'm going. I'm going to be healed on July 25th. I see it. It's right there just like I told you. There's where my miracle is. You've got to get me there. 
She said, Mama, the doctor said we're not to move you and take you. We, that's not. She said, no, you got to get me there. So she called the other brothers and sisters. Mom's hysterical. I can't calm her down. She won't quit crying. And all she keeps talking about is going to Lubbock, Texas, to something she saw in the newspaper. If I'd have known, I'd have never had the newspaper on the floor. And so the kids come over, and they're trying to console her. And call, she said, no, I'm telling you, that's my miracle. You've got to get me there. You've got to take me there. And finally, the one brother said to the nurse, said, well, What's it going to hurt? Can we take her? And he said, no, the doctor said not to move her. We can't take her. That's his instructions. And he said, well, if she dies on the way, what difference? At least she dies happy. This is something she really wants. Why don't we try to accommodate? So they all got their heads together and decided, and they started calling all the ambulances around, and no one, no one would carry her in the ambulance. They said, no, she'll die on the way. We would not want to be responsible. They said, we won't hold you. We'll sign papers that you will not be liable. We will take. They said, no, we will not take her. So Price Funeral Home, who was going to do her funeral, the mother said that they said, well, let's call Price Funeral Home. And they said, well, you know, you're going to ha have an ambulance and, and you've got the Hertz car and all that for my mom's funeral. Could we just pay you extra to take my mom to this meeting? If she dies on the way, you're going to take care of her body anyway and do everything. We just got to keep her happy and because she's hysterical. Could you? And they're like, well, they said, we'll sign papers. You're not liable. Just please, please take us. So the family, they said, okay. So they went and got oxygen, put it in the ambulance and they took her to my dad's meeting in Lubbock, Texas. And while she was laying on the bed, dad was out there praying and he came up on this lady. He laid his hands. He said, God's going to heal you. She said, yes, sir, brother Co, he is. He said, well, when's he going to do it? She said, right now. He said, well, then you're healed. She said, I am brother Co. He said, well, then get up. She said, I can't. I'm barefooted and got my nightgown on. He said, well, wrap the sheet around you and get up anyway. So she wrapped the sheet around her, got up and danced all over the place and shouted all over the place. And she went over to the guys in the ambulance, and she said, now you go on home. I'm going to ride home with my kids because I'm healed. They said, well, what, what if you really need us? What if they've done something there and it wears off? Then, then we've already gone home. Maybe we better stay. She said, nope. I'm telling you, I already had this dream. I know I, I was going to be healed. Now I am healed. Now you go on back home, and when tomorrow when I get up and around, I'll come and pay you. I'll pay the bill and take care of it. I said, ma'am, I'm going to tell you what. If you don't need us, that's fine, but we, we ain't going to charge you. We're charging you nothing because what we saw tonight was worth every penny and said, you don't owe us nothing. You don't have to come. She said, well, I'll come settle up. I said, nope, you don't owe us. This is on us. So the next few days, they, they called the doctor, and she's still alive, and they said, we got to bring Mom in. She's eating. She's walking around. He said, there's no way. Get her in here right now. They ran tests on her. The seven-pound tumor was gone. She has appendix. He said, where did she get these appendix? Those appendix were ruptured and gone. Where did she get these appendix? And the cancer was gone. <laughs> Why? Because it's undeniable. And it's unexplainable. They were wanting to know how this happened and how that they took her on this ride and what tent meeting and what were they doing there and how did they do it. Well, all we can tell you is the story, but we can't explain the miracle. All we can say it's unexplainable, yet it's undeniable. I'm telling you it's time the church get back into the unexplainable, yet the undeniable. The greatest miracle of all is salvation. You really can't explain it. Trying to explain somebody that loves you that much, that God sent his only beloved son to come on this earth to be man and dwell among us and yet be 100% God and 100% man to die on a cross to take our place because God so loved the world that he sent his son and his son so loved us that he died on the cross, took our place for our sins, sickness, and, and torment so that we may be saved, healed, and delivered. And really, honestly, we can't explain it. We can tell people, well, for God so loved the world, John 3, 16, that's why. Well, yeah, but why does he love you? All the things you've done, all the places you've been. Why would he? I don't know. I don't understand this kind of love. 
And I, my little mind's been trying to wrap around it, but I'm so glad, even though I can't explain it, I can't deny that I'm not the same Joanna I used to be. The things I used to like to do, I don't like to do no more. I can't deny that he saved my soul, he cleansed and he made me whole, and it's time that we realize we serve the unexplainable, undeniable God that does the supernatural. And I'm saying again, the supernatural should be natural in the church. We should be saying, you need to come to our house. What do you mean? You need to come to our church. This happens. That happens. Blind eyes open. The lame walk. The deaf hear. People get healed. Cancer dies at the root. And, and people say, well, I don't know about that. Explain it. I can't explain it. But yet I can't deny it because I sit right there and watch one that had no eyeballs get eyeballs. I saw one that their hand grew out and had no hand. I saw the miraculous right before my eyes. All I can tell you is you want to be, see the unexplainable, undeniable, come to the house of God. We got people today, they're taking people away from the house of God because they say, we'll just go in and empty the hospitals. Well, what's happening instead of that, we're empty in the churches. Right? He didn't say you got to go. I don't read anywhere in here says go empty the hospitals. But I do read in here where he said, gather yourselves together. Forsake not yourself assembling together, brethren. And when you go throughout, even to the man with the withered hand, when Jesus walked into the temple, he said, stretch forth your hand. And when he was on his way to and from church and preaching the gospel, they brought a blind man. The blind man who said, Jesus took and he spit in the dirt. And they said, now he took that dirt and when he spit in it, he made clay out of it. And he put it on the man's eyes. And he said, now go wash in the pool of Salon. And when the man went and washed, he came back. He said, I can see clearly now the rain has come. Or maybe I should say, the snow has come. <laughs> I can see all obstacles in my way. Amen. He's seeing. Now, people are saying, explain that one to me. Well, I don't know. It's unexplainable. I don't know, but we're going to send the scientists down there. Go down there and get that dirt. What area did he pick that dirt up from right in here? Okay, gather up all you can in this Ziploc bag, and let's take it back. And they experiment, and they do it in the microscope, and then they said, okay, go find that Jesus and get some of his spit. Must be in the spit. Can you explain how you can take that spit and turn it to mud and blind eyes are open? We need an explanation of this. Well, I'm here to tell you it's unexplainable, but it's undeniable because the blind man sees. Amen. Amen. But he sees. Acts 14, 4, 14 and 16 says, and then we're going to go to Luke 5. We'll touch more on Acts 4, 14 and 16, probably tomorrow night and the next. But tonight he kind of switched the direction a little bit. Acts 4, 14. And beholding the man which was healed. Go ahead and say it, was healed. That doesn't mean that he came uh, hoping for a miracle. He's already healed. You don't need to come hoping for a miracle. You need to come expecting a miracle. That's what's wrong in a lot of churches today. Oh, I'm hope, I hope, I hope, I hope and pray. It's my night. I hope he. No, I come expecting. Expectation breeds miracles. And it said the man was healed. It's already happened. He's got a miracle. Healing is the children's bread. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. Say unexplainable. They could say nothing against it. Say it again. Verse 16. Saying, what shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them. Is manifest. See, we need the manifestation. Some people are healed, but they don't have their manifestation yet. And the reason I know they're healed, because he said by his stripes we are healed. And he's already paid for our healing. 
We just don't always know how to receive it and believe it and always accept what he's doing. Amen. But yet, he also had the manifestation. See, that's why I say, Lord, when I'm praying, not only heal them, but manifest right now. Give them the manifestation of their miracle, of their healing. And so here they're saying, what shall we do these men for that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem. Let's just say here Orangeville. Isn't that where the city is? Are we in Orangeville right now? Cali? Caledon, okay, in Caledon. Caledon and Orangeville, we'll tie them both in. That dwell in Caledon and Orangeville. What? Where? At Jehovah Jireh. Come on. And we cannot deny it. Say undeniable. And we cannot deny it. Not because somebody said, well, I feel good, I think. No, we saw it with our own eyes, and they felt the manifestation, and everyone in the house saw it. And yet there's the government trying to figure out, and the religious people who have drawn in Peter and John and the lame man at Gate View and wanting to know what happened here. See, let me tell you, when the supernatural gets back in the church, the government's going to get involved, like it or not. The city councils and the mayors and the doctors and the pharmaceutical companies are all going to get involved, and they're going to try to call in, what is happening in your place and how come this is happening? We want you to explain this to us. Well, we're sorry, but... We didn't do it. What do you mean we didn't do it? Who did it? Where is he? Oh, Jesus. Well, where is he? Well, just hang out in our service for a while and you'll meet him. Amen. I had that happen at one place. They said, well, we want to talk to your husband, this miracle that he prayed for this lady, and the cancer's gone, and we, she was supposed to be dead, and she's still alive, and we want to know what he did. And I think they were trying to come and figure out how to make some money and maybe even... Uh, or either that or she's a very wealthy woman and so they had money to gain and now they're going to lose it because she lives. Amen. Amen. And they're wanting to know. I said, he's not with me. He's not here. What do you mean we have to talk to him? They got cameras. They got phones. They got uh, a lawyer, a doctor, and, and the caregiver all standing there. I said, he's not here. But he didn't do it. What do you mean he didn't do it? That lady said he prayed for him. Y'all were here, da, da, da. I said, he didn't do it. Well, who did it? I said, someone else did it. Really? Well, where are they? I said, well, he'll be here. He will? He's coming to me. He'll be at this meeting. Okay. I said, well, what? I said, just sit down and wait. You'll see. Amen. It was right there in Columbia. This lady had cancer and my husband said, there's a sore on your body that won't heal. In three days, it will heal and scab off and fall on your bed. And then he saw like two upper trees with no leaves. It was all black. He said, God, what is that inside her body? And the Lord said, it's cancer. And when the Lord said cancer, it turned snow white. And he said, God, what are you doing? And he said, I'm killing it at the root. And so he told her that. And then when she left, she still looked the same. We didn't see the manifestation right then and there. But yet God was moving. They made her have surgery. She kept saying, I'm eating. I feel good. And I've got the scab from my sore that would never heal that fell on my bed. And the things he said, and they're like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They cut her open, and they found no cancer. Yeah. So the next year, they want to talk to him. What did your husband do? I said, he didn't do it. We need some explanations. We need to know. I mean, here they are already with notebooks to write down. And I said, just have a seat right there, and you can meet the one who did it. Really? I said, yes. Worship happened. I preached it. I'm not even through with my sermon, and there's a man sitting in a wheelchair right in front of me here. And his head's bobbed back, his tongue's hanging out, his whole body is limp. And it came out of my mouth before I could stop myself because I thought, 
what did I just say? I walked over to the man in the wheelchair and I said, sir, you're a pastor and God's not finished with you yet. You still have ministry and you have things to complete and done and God's going to begin to heal you. And as I said that, tears and the caregiver with that guy in the uh, wheelchair fell on the floor and started crying. His wife started, oh, started crying as the interpreter's telling him what I said. Now the guy's leaning back and all of a sudden the slobber stops slobbering and his tongue barely there goes into his mouth. And slowly his head starts coming up, slowly in front of, and he starts moving his head, turning around. Now, I don't know what they, they called it either. It was MS or MD, and I get those two confused. But that was what was wrong, and he was in the latter parts of deterioration, fixing to have feeding tube put in him because every muscle was already destroyed. He couldn't eat, and he couldn't move his hands. But then he began to move his arms and his shoulders, and he began to move his hand. His wife hit the floor weeping and crying. The caregiver is, I knew it, I knew it. He was not a, a nurse or a caregiver before his pastor got sick and he said, I'm going to school because I'm gonna take care of you. I love you so much. And he said, I knew God wasn't through. I knew God wasn't. And he's weeping and crying. And here is these guys over there looking. So then the next person next to me, I'm, I know God's still working on him. I go to the one next to me. He's got metal crutches. I haven't seen these kind. They wrapped around the arm, something wrapped here, wrapped here. And I guess whenever it was on, something strapped around even the legs that as he walked and he had these stoppers, the things helped him to do the walking with these metal crutches. And I said, <clears throat> sir, are you ready to walk? He said, oh, no, no, no. I don't know what he's saying in Spanish. I said, tell him I said arise and be healed. Get up. And I grabbed his arm, and I helped pull him up. And I had the other, and I said, Andy, help me. And we both pulled him up, and all of a sudden, strength started coming. And, and I said, let's walk. So Andy tells him, and he's just at first, and then he starts walking. And then, now, it's really funny because he had the crutches, and all of a sudden, he's holding them in the air, and he's walking. He's walking. Woo! He's walking. <laughs> And as he's walking, here's those doctor, lawyer, and caregiver. I walked straight to the back. There was a little boy in a coma. I didn't know it was wrong. He was about two, maybe three years old. He was a toddler. And as I walked back there, I said, what's wrong with this child? And they're telling me he's in a coma. He had swallowed a grape. And the grape got lodged, so I cut up my grapes for my grandkids. So y'all cut those grapes up for these kids, okay? I didn't know that could happen, but it can happen. And it got lodged, and he died, and they brought him back to life, and they put a tube in, but he never came back with his brain, his mind. He stayed in a coma. And I began to pray for that little boy, and I began to cry out. I said... God, this is just a little boy. It's not his fault. He needs a miracle right now. And as I'm praying, those eyes pop open, that head starts turning, and he looks up at me and smiles, and I said, hey, sweetie, and he lifts his head, and the nurse, his nurse with him, grabs those things, you know, you listen to heartbeat. She's throwing a thermometer in his mouth. She's putting pressure to check blood pressure. She's quickly doing that. The mother's screaming. I don't know what she's screaming. Here comes those three. Now, they already been down there to the guy in the wheelchair talking, taking pictures. They already went to the guy at the crutches. Now they walk back, and this mother is in their face. And I'm like, Andy, what's going on? Because I don't speak Spanish. He said, well, he's trying to ask her, did I just wake that child up? And the nurse and the mother got so mad, they jumped in their faces and said, I am his nurse, and that's why I'm trying to check it. And you being a doctor should know what a coma is. And da, 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 da. No, he was in a coma. He had been that way for a year and a half, and now he's, he's here. Why, we don't understand. We don't know what's going on. They're trying, to, he's, they're trying to ask her how this could happen. And she's like, well, you're a doctor. You explain it to me. I'm here to tell you God does the unexplainable, yet the undeniable. There were many more miracles that happened at the end of the meeting. They said, well, where is the guy that did this lady? You told me we would meet him. I said, sirs, if you haven't met him by now, you're never going to meet him. He was here, there. He was here, there. He was here with that child. His name is Dr. Jesus. 
I said, his name is Dr. Jesus. Let me tell you, science cannot figure it out. And that's the reason why they cannot really totally receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And so the two don't. They should. They should come together because science does prove God's word if they would quit trying to, I just got to explain it. Well, some things, doctors, scientists, is unexplainable, yet undeniable. I was asking the Lord while sitting there, what's it going to take for us to church? What's it going to take for us to begin to move in this again? What's it going to take for the church to get back into the unexplainable yet the undeniable. He took me to Luke 5, and if you look there, and it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God. That's hunger. When people press in to hear the word of God, to be in God's presence, that means they're hungry. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. He'll fill you up to overflow. And he wants to fill you up. Blessed. And they pressed into the word. What made them so hungry for this? It said that they were by the lake of Gennesaret. And Gennesaret, if you remember when Jesus crossed over, there was a man who was come from the tombs who had a uh, legion of demons. And he said, who are you? He said, we're legion because we're many. And if you come to cast us out, cast us into the pigs. And Jesus said, then go into the pigs. He said the word go. Let me tell you, sometimes all we got to speak sometimes, go in the name of Jesus. And the pigs ran off and they ran to Jesus and said, get out of town. We don't want you. You've destroyed our economy. You, we can't explain. People are ha asking how that boy, we used to chain him. We chained him to the graves. We chained him to the trees. We threw meat at him. He was a wild man. He ran through the neighborhoods naked. My wife would holler at me, Honey, the naked man's in our yard again. He said, Well, shut the curtains. I know, but you need to go out there, get the people. So we'd get nets, we'd throw it on him, we'd chain him. He cut himself with rocks. He would holler at night. He would wake us up screaming. And yet now he's sitting here clothed in his right mind. What happened? Clothed in his right mind. God wants to put us back in our right mind. He wants the church to be in its right mind. This mind be in us that's in Christ Jesus. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Whew. We quote these scriptures, but we got to grab a hold of them. The word is what causes us to press into him. Faith is the word. The word is faith because Jesus is the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Here he's sitting here. And so the, the man at Gennesaret said, I want to go with you. Take me with you, Jesus. He said, no, you stay and you show your scars where you cut yourself and show them how you're in your right mind. Now, instead of people screaming, the naked man in our yard said, hey, the guy who used to cut himself is telling us about a man named Jesus. He's got on clothes and he talks like a, a sensible man. He's talking to us. And he went, I'm sure everywhere he went, revival broke out. By the time Jesus came back to that area, they go, we got to go find out somebody. We couldn't, we chained that guy. And he would break the chains. We did everything we could, and we couldn't hold that guy down. And this man comes across in a boat, and he tells him, go. And like that, the man is set free, and he's in his right mind. Where is this coming from? Well, that man's in town again. See, the great thing is, is every time we gather in his name, or two or three are gathered in his name, he's in the midst. We're, he's in the house right now. Doctor Jesus, healer Jesus, mortgage Jesus, banker Jesus, everything we have need of is in him, and he is in the house. And they pressed in. And saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them, and they were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little bit. And he sat down and taught the people 
out of the ship. Now, I want you to catch that right there. He thrust out a little. We've been thrusting a little bit. In fact, sometimes we even say, this is it. We're going to take off like the rocket. Ten, nine, eight, seven. It's going to be a thrust in the house today. We're going to thrust a little bit. Woo, and that feel good. That feels great. I got ghost bumps today in church. <laughs> we went on a boat ride. It wasn't no little rowboat. <laughs> I'm telling you, he got a hold of my engines inside of me, and that thrust in that motor inside of me, I got to thrust today in church. But a lot of times we leave the thrust right here. We get it? And have a day or two back at home. And rah, 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 rah. No, 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 woe is me. Like the children of Israel. We don't want manna no more. We want meat. So God gives them meat. We don't want meat no more. But when they cried out, Jesus, son of David, come and help us. Get us out. He said, I hear a cry. And he said, go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Because he cares so much about us that our cries and what we speak. He said to one man, he said to um, Smith Wigglesworth, I think it was. It might have been another one. I'd have to look at my notes. Oh, no, it was Kenneth Hagin. Kenneth Hagin, he had his wife was dying. And he began to cry out as yet, I believe it was cancer. And he said, God, you need to heal my wife. I'm asking you. I know you heal, and I'm asking you. And he said, you know what? Because they said she's going to die. And even God, he had even heard, she's going to die. She said, honey, it's my time. you got to let me go. And he said, I know it's her time, God, but I don't want her to go. Would you let me keep my wife? Would you heal her? And he began to ask, and God said, since you ask, I will. He said, all I want them to do, my church, my people, to ask, but they won't ask me. He said, but because you asked me, your wife will live, and I'm going to heal her. And he said, but most of the time they whine and complain and they beg and they, what are you doing? Why are you doing this to me, God? They get mad at me. They blame me. And he said, all I ask them to do is just ask me. Just ask me. What does the Bible say? Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. And immediately his wife got up. And he said, it was just because I asked. But he said, my asking wasn't in doubt or fear. My asking was in faith, believing, and my wife got to live longer. He did that before with Hezekiah in the Bible. The prophet already told him, it's your time. But Hezekiah turned his face to the wall, and he asked. And Jesus said, Isaiah, go on back in there and tell Hezekiah he'll live 15 more years. Amen? Sometimes, church, we just got to ask. We're trying to explain things, and we're trying to figure things out, and we're making things harder than they should be. We don't need to do that. It's really more simple than we make it. I don't really know. I can't explain it, but let me tell you, I can't deny it. And hot dog, I got it. Amen. Amen. And so here he said, okay, let's just thrust out a little bit. And he sat down and he taught the people. Now, when he had left speaking, and this is what the Lord began to show me sitting there, he said unto Simon, launch out to the deep. The Lord's calling you into depth. He said it's time for this church to go deep. Not just a thrust, not just another feel-good service, not just another shout me down, but he said it's time to get deep. I've got a net for you, and it's time. If you do the natural, he said, I'll do the supernatural. I began to look at that, and he said, people are not going deep enough in me. They get just enough to get what they want because they think I'm Jimmy, give me. He said, but if they would get in depth, they would understand the deep things of God and the deep things that I do. They would understand, even though they can't explain it, they would understand more of what I'm saying in my word because my word is truth. And they say, the church says, oh, his word's truth and God don't lie, but yet we don't believe him. I'm not looking at anybody. I'm just telling you what I heard sitting there because I have a different message with different notes that I sit over there and he just stopped it and he said, no, before you go to that, go to this, that it's time to go deep. 
you're saying you want the unexplainable yet the undeniable, then you've got to go deep. Oh, we have to earn it? No, it's not an earning. You fall in love with him, you'll want to know more about him. You fall in love with him, you'll begin to say, I need to understand this more. What are you saying, Lord? I can't explain how you created this world, but I know one thing you did. I can't explain how the children of Israel crossed on dry land. I can't explain that the waters parted. In fact, when they were there, they were in fear, and they were in doubt, and they were in stress. The church was in worry. And they said, oh, Moses, did you bring us out here to die? At least we had a tombstone in Egypt. And Moses said, fear not. Stand still and see the hand of God. How would I understand this hand of God? When I get in the depth of him, I understand. I may not can explain it. It still may be unexplainable, but I can't deny what he's doing because he's doing it in me and he's doing it around and those people around me. And he said, launch out to the deep. Now the children of Israel are standing there crying and he says, Moses, my promises, my word is yes and amen. What's in your hand? He said, stretch it forth. And he stretched it, and they walked across on dry land. Now, scientists for years have said, well, that was real shallow water then, and they had some real big rocks, and they walked across on the rocks. So, said, well, then it must be a bigger miracle. So, said, what do you mean? If it was shallow water and it drowned Pharaoh and all his army, that's really a big miracle then. <laughs> oh, Oh, well, we can't explain this. Come on, church. And so they've tried to explain it. They've tried to even go parts of the Red Sea, but they said, no, they've crossed here. So they have sent divers down into the deep part of that Red Sea where they said that Moses and the children of Israel crossed over. They have found seaweed and all kinds of junk that looks the shapes of wheels and chariots. They have found swords. They have found uh, breastplates. They have found bones of dead bodies uh, of lots of, they said, they must have had the waters parted. Because down in this deep water is evidence their wheels got stuck in the mud and their soldiers died. It's unexplainable, yet it's undeniable. He's ready for the church to launch out into the deep and let down your net. If you do the natural, God does the supernatural. See, we're afraid to let down our net. We're afraid to lay hands on the sick and cast out devils and cleanse the lepers. What if they don't get healed? What if they do? Yeah, but what if they don't get delivered? But what if they do? Cast your net. Yeah, but I, I, it makes me look bad. Well, then it, it's all about you. You don't do it anyway. He's the one who does it. <laughs> He's the supernatural God. We got our children in a mess who's into Superman and Batman and into Harry Potter and everything else that they can try to find that these super games were flying heroes and they all want to go around with a cape in the house trying to jump off the staircase because they want to be super like the super ones. They got what's a... a Wonder Dog, and I don't know what all my grandkids have all this super stuff. I'm a little bitty one. Joel runs around with a little cape on. I said, who are you? And he tells me some name. I don't know what it is. It runs real fast and it flies. And I said, you know why my grandkids are into that? Because the church isn't doing what the church should be doing. Do you know why your children are into these games? And in they're looking for the supernatural that should already be in the church. And so the enemy knows that the supernatural is real. So he's, he's never done anything that's real. He does imitation. So he's already set up all this imitation to draw our young people and our children away because he is afraid and he knows when God begins to move in the church again with the supernatural, it's going to have those young people and kids saying, forget Batman and Superman, Wonder Dog, look at this. Blind eyes open the lame walk. Cancer falls off of faces. Like my dad told that one woman, I've told some of you that before, he said, hold your dress. And she grabbed over the top of her dress and he ran back and hit her in the stomach. Lost five dress sizes. I said, I want that line. <laughs> but it was a tumor. And the thing dissolved and disappeared right there. 
Can you imagine sitting in the middle of that? Sitting in the middle of the supernatural happening in front of your eyes, trying to go back out and tell, I'm telling you, she had to hold her dress. They were trying to find a belt and pins and everything because her dress would have fallen off and she couldn't let go. And yet she's shouting and dancing, holding on to that dress. Hey! What a story. But it ain't just a story. It's a true story of the supernatural that my God does. People be saying, well, explain that to me. Well, why don't you just come to church with me and I don't have to explain it. You can see it with your own eyes and find out it's undeniable. Amen. Let down your nets for a drought. I'm fixing the overload. I'm fixing to fill people up. I'm fixing to do multiplication and increase, just as she said. And we hadn't talked, and I didn't even know that she was going to say that when he was changing my notes. I do the multiplication. All you got to do is cast your net with faith, believing, knowing who I am in Christ Jesus. And watch what I'll do. Now, Peter was a fisherman. He was why well, he said, I fished all night. I know these waters. They hire me. I bring it in. I'm, I'm one of the top fishermen in this county. My family is known all around here. They buy fish from us. And, and really, I don't, I, you're good with your word, and you're good with preaching, and you draw crowds, and, and I'm hungry about what you said, and I'm glad you got in my boat today because it feels good having you in here, and that thrust feels good, but I don't know about casting my net. I just cleaned it. I just cleaned it. See, we already start trying to figure things out and trying to explain things to God when what he does is unexplainable. Quit, just do what he says. He said finally too, and this is what I like. This is what I want you to get. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we've told all night and have nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word. Go ahead and say it. At thy word. Nevertheless, at thy word. Let me tell you something. It's all right here. His promises are yes and amen. You have 7,864 promises in this book. He said, I am the Lord that healeth thee. I am the Lord your healer. Receive your sight. Your faith has made you whole. Wilt thou be made whole? I don't know, God. I have no man to put me in the water. And every time I go to get in, somebody beats me. Arise, take up your bed and walk. His words become life. His words become truth. His words begin to bring manifestation. At thy word. Problem is, is we don't really literally believe what we're reading because if we did we would do it the word at thy word that's when people say well all roberts and different ones said your dad had the boldest was the boldest man of faith the reason he had such bold faith because he took him at his word he said, you said, and your word says. And he tell people, I believe every comma, every period, every colon, everything that's printed in this word, I believe it and he'll do it. And he literally took God at his word. And that's why he saw people come out of hospital beds. He saw the blind eyes open, the lame walk, the deaf hear. He saw people, uh, like one boy, he was sitting there, his tongue hanging out, slobbering on himself. He was all twisted up. He was not. His mind was gone. He, he had some disease that deformed his whole body, and he was all messed up in this wheelchair. And my dad walked over, and he said, Honey, turned to my mom. He said, Honey, if God don't heal this boy, he don't come out of this chair healed. He said, We're selling the trucks. And she said, She just kind of nodded. He said, No, listen, do you hear me, honey? God don't heal this boy tonight. I'm selling the trucks. He took God at his word. He was saying the trucks, meaning the trucks that carried the tent, that carried the chairs, the, the 18-wheelers. We're selling the trucks. Then he turned around. He grabbed that boy, picked him up out of that wheelchair, and said some prayer crying over him, and then he threw him in the air. No church. 
But when he landed on his feet, his tongue went in his mouth. He ran all over the place, and his mind came back. Every twisted, disordered part of his body was made whole. They said, how did Brother Go have these kind of miracles? Because he took him at his word. And because of that, not, they said, well, you have the miracles, you and your husband, because your father's Jack Cow. No, it's because we take him at his word. I lay hands on the sick. I sit there. He was talking about one that I prayed for in the book he was reading. And I'll never forget, it was a blind man. And they told me, this blind man's going to come to church tonight, and he's going to receive his sight. And I said, praise the Lord. And I hung up and said, oh, God, they're bringing a blind man tonight, and they want me to pray for him. So when they bring him, they sit him down, and I'm up there, and I'm preaching. And when I get through, I start praying for people here and going this way, and the blind man over there. And God said, what are you doing? I said, well, you know. He said, no, I don't know. Tell me what you're doing. I said, God, the blind man's over there. He said, I know. You've been telling me. What are you doing? I said, I'm working it up. He said, what are you working up? I said, you know, faith. He said, well, when you get it worked up, let me know. Come on. See, we're worried about our reputation. We're worried about how we're going to look. You can't heal a headache on a fly, so quit worrying about it. He didn't tell you to make sure you could do it. He said, lay hands on the sick, cast out devils, cleanse the leopards, raise the dead. Freely you receive, freely give. When the church stands up and takes God at his word, we're going to begin to see the unexplainable, yet the undeniable. We're right there in Lebanon, Virginia. They called it healing on the mountain, miracle after miracle. One guy couldn't lift his arm, and he was uh, in a cane and a walker, couldn't hardly move, and... Uh, my husband prayed for him. His arm went in the air. His leg got to dancing. He got all excited, and he got healed. And then another lady came up with COPD, and she's, <laughs> I thought, she's going to die right here. Get her a chair. Hurry, somebody sit her down. And I said, what? and somebody with her, because she couldn't even talk. <laughs> and I said, what's wrong with you? And the other one said, she's got COPD. It's really bad. I said, I can hear it. So I started praying. I'm like, my hands, Jesus, in the name of Jesus, you foul demon, get your hands. My husband walks over and said, honey, run your hands up and down her back. And he says, he said, I see it. It's black. It's all black. He said, oh, oh, I see it like a wind. Like, the, oh, there it goes. There. He said, it's gone. Take a deep breath. And she went, he said, take a deep. And she went, oh, oh. and she jumps up. And she started, oh, and, and the pastor's singing, look what the Lord has done, look what, hands her the mic, and she starts, look what the Lord has done, and she's dancing and singing and running all over the place, and there's this little guy sitting in this easy chair, little be skinny guy, and he's sitting in this easy chair, and she danced and got so happy in the Lord, she fell on top of him, and all you can see is his little hands and legs like, help me. I said, boy, that's real good for COPD to sing and dance. Do you know because of her miracle the next night, her daughter and three rows of her family showed up. The girl came back to the Lord who was a prodigal crying. My mom was so bad she was dying. Look, look, and, and the pastor hands her the mic again. Sing, sister, and she starts singing again. Look what, though, dancing all over the church. Sisters running to the altar. Her, her daughters running to the altar. Her family, pray for me, pray for me. Why? Because the unexplainable yet the undeniable happen. That's what I want to be in. I'm tired of church as usual. Yeah, it's boring. No wonder people don't want to come. Sometimes it's boring. But if you don't know the word, it's the reason why you need to be in the house of God. Because the word. If you don't know the word, you're not going to know what to stand on. Some of them think it's that song we used to sing. And they get their Bible down below and stand. I stand up on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E, the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand up on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Woo! No, we stand because of what's in us. 
We stand because we know in whom we have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. That's how. And he said, nevertheless, that thy word will let down the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net broke. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ships, and said, come on, help us. This is more than we can handle. It's the overflow. It's the multiplication. It's the increase. We did the natural. God did the supernatural. And we can't even begin to bring it in. So much so the boats were sinking. And you know what happened? Peter fell on his face and repented. You see, when the undeniable and unexplainable gets back in the church, people will be running and falling on their faces before God. He said, I'm not good enough. How is it you're in my boat? I'm not good enough. Yet you come into my boat. God wants to not only be in your boat, but he wants to go deep with you in the boat. And he wants to fill you up to overflow. And he wants to bless you. He wants to bless you coming in and going out. When people say, how come your wallet's so thick in your back? And how come your wife's purse so heavy? She got gold in there? Yep, she's got gold and coins and money. How come your briefcase, your bank account, they say you keep bringing in wads? I know, it's in my boat. Where's your boat? Right here. Boom, boom. <laughs> Jesus is in it. And he wants to take me into that depth of him. And I believe that when we begin to launch out into those deep things, the deep things are going to begin to happen in this church. I believe the reason the Lord's been talking to me, talk about the unexplainable, undeniable, because I believe he wants to get back in the churches with it. He don't want it to be just an A.A. A. Allen, William, Branham, Jack Cole day. He don't want it just to be to over 2,000 years ago. He don't want it to be just a Smith Wigglesworth and, and Catherine Kuhlman and Amy Simple McPherson. But he said, I want it today because I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Amy Simple McPherson was preaching away. I'll close with this. And as she was preaching away, the Lord tapped her on the shoulder. She was halfway in her sermon, and he said, I want to do a creative miracle tonight. She stopped her preaching, and she said, God said he wants to do a creative miracle tonight. Where are you? Nobody moved for 10 minutes. She waited. God's going to do a creative miracle tonight. Who is it? Where are you? Finally, she went back to preaching. She'd been preaching along for about five or six minutes, and the Lord tapped her again. He said, I said, tonight, I want to do a creative miracle. She stopped again, and she said, where are you? God wants to do a creative miracle tonight. Who are you? Where are you? They sat quiet. Nobody moved. After a little bit, finally, a lady had a child on her lap with a blanket. She pulled the blanket off, and she lifted the child, and she said, you mean like this? The child had no arms, no legs, and the face was distorted. And she said, yes, bring me that child like this. She took that child in her arms and weeping and praying. She said, now let's worship. Everybody, let's worship him. And for 30 minutes, people began to sing and worship, not just sing a song because they knew it, worshiping him and during that 30 minutes as they, she carried that baby having people worship and them were crying out to God worshiping they begin to watch the arms come out all the way to hands they begin to watch the legs come out all the way to feet and the distorted face was made normal it's unexplainable yet it's undeniable it's what God wants to do today I was at Tanya Pugh's church. I said I was going to close, but one more, because I want you to know he's still doing it today. She said that Sunday night we had a three-night service, and the speaker that was there with us helping speak, he couldn't stay that night. He had to fly out, Tony Cherez. She said, would you and your sister need to stay and pray for the people? And I said, yes. She told the people, said, we're just going to have worship, and then we're going to pray for the sick. 
So after that, they worshiped for a while. I got in the middle. My sister got on the end, and they had Beverly Wilhot, who's a prophet, at the other end. She says, now, whoever needs healing, needs prayer, needs a word, whatever, come on up. They started piling some in my line, some in my sister's line, some over there to Beverly. Here come a mother with this beautiful little boy. He was about three years old, had dark, shiny hair, bouncy looking. And I leaned forward to ask her what she wanted prayer for. I thought she was just holding her child. She said, could you pray for my baby? And I said, well, yeah, what's wrong? He looked healthy. He looked fun. She said, he has a tumor right here. And she put my hand there, and I could feel this tumor sticking out. I had my hand on it. I said, oh, my goodness. Yes, I'll pray. I said, God, you did it in my dad's day. You melted the tumors like snow. And you tell me you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I'm not going to accept this little boy leaving with this tumor. I said, God, I'm expecting right now the unexpected and the undeniable and the unexplainable. I am expecting a miracle. And as my hand was there, I could just feel it melting away. And I thought, it's melting, it's melting, it's going. Now, the devil's a liar. He'll try to steal, kill, and destroy. John 10, 10 even tells you. And he said, oh, it's because that's what you want. It feels like it's melting. It's not really melting. It's in your psychological mind. You have to come back against him. And instead of me saying, you're a liar, your feet stink, and you don't love Jesus, so get your stinking feet out of my face and under my feet. I said, Mama, would you do me a favor? Would you put your hand here and see if you can find that tumor? She put her hand up there, and she began to feel, and she began to feel. She began to feel, and then she went, she said, where'd it go? Oh, I don't know, but where'd it go? Where'd it go? I said, hallelujah, liar, liar, pants on fire. I'm getting excited, ready to run. And she said, wait, 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 wait. She said, can you pray for his legs? And I thought, what? And I looked down, and this little boy had braces on his legs. I began to run my hands up and down that little boy's legs. And I didn't even ask what was wrong. I just, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, heal and strengthen these legs in the name of Jesus. And then I said, what was something he couldn't do? She said he couldn't jump. And I said, would you like to jump for Jesus? He's uh-huh. So she set him down. I said, go ahead, jump for Jesus. And he tried. He tried. I said, that's okay. We'll pray again. She said, would you like Mommy to take your braces off? He said, uh-huh. She set him down. She took the little braces off. Of course, Tanya grabs the braces running off through the church. And I'm saying to the little boy, okay, stand up here. And said, would you like to jump for Jesus now? Uh-huh. And he started jumping. And he started jumping and jumping some more. And then he jumped high. And then I said, okay, well, let's walk. And he started walking. And then he took off running. <laughs> I was like, whoa. And as he's running back, mom's on the floor weeping and crying. And I said, are you okay? And she said, you don't understand. You don't understand. I said, understand what? She said when he would walk, one foot would hit the other and he would fall over. And he had no arches look. He's got arches, and he can run, and he can walk. I'm here to tell you Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forever. I love being in the middle of church, and I love being in the middle of miracles. And he still heals today. Stand with me. All things are possible. Only believe, only believe, only believe. All things are possible, only believe, only believe. possible say it again all things are possible say lord i believe i want to tell some of you online even when i was in new york and in oklahoma 
Some people still on Zoom, they haven't come back to church. I'm, I'm going to talk more about that, but not tonight. But he's there when you see the day approaching. But sometimes there's some people, they can't make it. If it's fear that's stopping you, then shame on you. But if you're bed bound and you're sick, you can't get out, maybe like Stella Zimmerman, you know God wants to do a miracle and can, but you can't get out and nobody will bring you. It's not impossible where you're at. He can heal you right there. And we told the people, because when the worship got strong, we tell the people, you call in. You call into the church and we'll pray. And when we were in Oklahoma, Pastor Jimmy Milligan's church, people would call in and then we'd hear the report of the miracles because we were there several nights. Now, somebody here at Jehovah Jireh can put probably a number for you to call. I'm expecting you to call in if you need a miracle. We're expecting miracles to happen, even through the Internet. In New York City, they began to call in. And one lady was in the hospital, and she was dying. And her friends were there with her. And I said, put your hands on her and help me pray. The whole church stretched their hands, and we agreed in prayer together. And all of a sudden, you could hear screaming on the phone said what's up the ladies are saying she's sitting up saying she's hungry she's sitting up and we're trying to buzz the nurse she wants to eat got another call it was a pastor's daughter and i was down praying for people in the front and the pastor's daughter said this is my daughter on the phone please please take this call right now and i got a phone with the daughter and began to pray she had some kind of pain she had to have shots all the time they made a mistake in her uh cancer surgery and they cut some things and did some bad I don't remember I have to look back up the testimony but whatever they were having to do they, these were massive expensive shots and everything that was happening to her she couldn't get out to go to church and she knew what church was being a preacher's kid and right there the pain be and I told her I said you're called of God and ministry seeing you and God's going to heal you because he's ready for you to get back in church and he's ready for you to preach and testify and I didn't know her, but it was exactly right. She began to cry on the phone, and she said, you're right. God healed her. She went to the doctor and told him, I don't need your shots no more. And they said, well, now, this, you're, you're going to need them. She said, no, I don't. They knew they made a mistake, so they were offering everything to her for free, whatever the hospital had done and the things they had done to her. And they were worried because they don't want her to sue, so they were trying. They're like, oh, no, no, you must keep coming. And she said, you don't understand. I got healed. They said, explain this to us. She said, well, I don't know how to fully explain it, but all I can tell you is on the phone. She said, you mean somebody called you on the phone? Because the mother called her. I said, yeah. And they just prayed for you on the phone? I said, yeah. And that's how you got healed? She said, yeah, that's what happened. I'm telling you, a lady burned her hand on the stove, called in screaming and crying, I, my hand's on fire. And we all agreed and prayed, and she started shouting. She said, the fire is gone. My hand is fine. When she woke up the next day, there was a little pin blister the size of a pin was all she had. She said, I think that was to show me what God did. She said, I burnt my whole hand on that stove. So I'm telling you that. Call. You need a miracle call. And not only will this be the only time you'll need to call this church for prayer because God's going to use this church for miracles. And sometimes when you can't get here, you need to pick up the phone and call and have this church help agree in prayer for you to arise. And when God heals you, don't stay at home anymore. Get in the house of God. Amen. So I say that because God's going to move even on the Internet for people. People, sometimes you've got those at home you love. On your phone, we had in Lebanon, Virginia, they would bring us phones up. Call, this is my mom at home in bed. We would pray right there on the phone with them, and God would begin to heal them. This is what the church does. It's unexplainable, yet it's undeniable. That's what I want. And I'm not going to be happy till it's in the house of God again. I don't want to just tell the stories. I want you to be in the middle of the stories. I want you to tell me, Sister Joanna, guess what happened? 
It's unexplainable, yet it's undeniable. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. If we can, we'll remove this. I'm going to pray for the sick, but there's something else, and I believe there's a reason why the numbers are smaller tonight. I believe that the Lord wants to anoint some hands tonight. Impartation. You want in the miracles and you want to be a part. He said, all I ask is let me have your hands. Let me have your heart. Let me have your mind. And obey me. And watch what I'll do. So this ain't just to put oil on you so you can get another thrill and chill. You can get another thrust. Another impartation. Because some of you got so many impartations and you don't have hardly any of them developing. And I'm not criticizing you. But impartations are real and they're still inside of you and eventually they're going to start manifesting. And I really believe tonight that he's wanting to anoint hands. My dad said, and I, this is why I feel this, he, he said, everybody says Jack Coe did this, Jack Coe did that, Jack Coe. He said, Jack Coe doesn't do this. And he said, and I'm going to show you tonight that it's not Jack Coe. He said, I'm going to anoint. There was several rows of people sitting there and a lot of young people. He said, I'm going to anoint these few rows right here. And they're going to come up here, and they're going to pray for you. I'm not going to pray for you. I'm not going to pray for one of you. I'm going to have these people pray for you. And he said, God's going to use them, and miracles are going to happen, because I'm going to show you it's not Jack Coe, it's Jesus Christ. He brought those people up and those young people, and he began to anoint their hands. And he said, now come stand. And he, they stood across the front. He said, now come. All of you come and get in one of their lines. They're going to pray for you. People started coming in wheelchairs and crutches. One of the one boys at Papa Dorn knew the man, and he said, I said to myself, oh, good, mine looks okay. Nothing wrong with mine. He said, okay, this will be easy. Lady walked up, and she looked just fine. He said, what you want prayer for? He said, I was ready. And about that time, she pulled her blouse up. He said, there was this huge tumor there. He said, what do you want me to do with that? She said, I want you to get your hands on it and pray for it. He said, I can't help you with that. I can't. He said, Brother Cole said you could, boy. You better get your hands on me and pray for me right now. She said, or else. He said, I didn't know if I was afraid of her or the tumor after that. He said, but I put my hands. When I did, that thing disappeared. He said, after that, I said, next. It isn't you. It's him in you. And he's ready for the church to get back up. <laughs> he's ready for the church to be the church. And so if you need healing in your body, I want to pray for you too. But first, I want to anoint the hands of those who say, Sister Joanna, I want to step into that. And I don't want just a thrust of anointed hands. I want to go deep. I want to go deep. If he can do it for you, it ain't because I'm Jack Coe's daughter. It's because I get my hands on people. And I believe. And the same with those people that sit there that he laid hands on. They weren't Jack Coe's kids. It was just the impartation of the anointing that God wants to use people. He's, go ahead and say he wants to use me. Go ahead and point he wants to use me. And if that if you want to be used of him, that's what I want to do. Do you have some oil here? Ah. Shut up, Okoshe. 